Like I said, my name's Jesse. I serve here as a deacon, and I have the opportunity to share with you the message this morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing uh, our journey through the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 42 through 50. I've made it very easy today. There's a lot of information to cover. I didn't do a PowerPoint this morning, so if you really like the PowerPoint, I apologize. But uh, as I was developing this message and the Lord was speaking to me, I felt that I felt the presence of the Lord explain to me or tell me to, to minimize distractions. If we're, and if we're honest, we, we can get easily distracted with things, and that can be something as simple as a PowerPoint sometimes. But there's some very powerful information here in this passage. And, and, and this morning the Lord told me, he said, you know what, I just want you to share the message, and I want you to tell everyone to just relax. If you feel the need to take notes, you're more than welcome to. But just relax and hear this morning's message. It's a very, very, it's a very, very, very powerful direction that the Lord led me this week. It, it's, it's not so much discussing about us, but I feel it discusses the future. But before we get into today's message, let me tell you a story about a man named Mr. Yates. Mr. Yates owned a farm in Texas. The Great Depression hit, and he was having trouble keeping up payments on his farm. The bank began to press Mr. Yates and gave him 30 days to pay back or face foreclosure. With, we, with three weeks left to go, Mr. Yates opened the door, and he seen an oil company approaching him. And the oil company asked for permission to drill on his farm's property. Mr. Yates said, well, I'm about to lose the farm anyway in three weeks. What could it hurt? Go ahead, and he gave him permission to drill and signed a lease for the, for the oil company. That oil company did drill that day, and they hit a gusher, 200 barrels of oil in one day. Immediately, Mr. Yates became a millionaire. Now, the question is, is when did Mr. Yates become a millionaire? The moment the oil company started drilling or the moment he bought the farm? The answer is simple. The moment he bought the farm is when he became a millionaire. But yet he lived in poverty for so long because he never knew what was underneath the earth. And so many Christians today live in spiritual poverty because they don't take the time to dig. If indeed you are in Christ, you are blessed. If indeed you are in Christ, you are blessed. And if you feel like you're living in spiritual poverty, a good suggestion would be to maybe, just maybe, start digging and figure out your identity and who you are in Christ. And as we dig today, we're going to continue to chip away and to continue to dig at Mark chapter 9, and we're going to start at verse 42. So if you have your Bibles and wish to follow along, let's begin our reading this morning. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Verse 45, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed, um, excuse me, it is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom with one eye rather than having two to be cast into hell fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Finally, verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will, it, how will you season it? Have salt in yourself and have peace with one another. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you, God, thanking you for this day, God, thanking you for this opportunity, God, to to hear your word and to receive your word, God. And I know that there's nothing that Jesse can formulate. There's no opinion that Jesse could have. There's no eloquent words that Jesse could put together to make your word and your message any more meaningful, God. 
So, Father, I pray and I ask that I decrease and you increase in us, God, that your word go forth and it touches lives here today, God, that we remain open and receptive to the message that you have for us, God, and we thank you in advance for what you're going to do here today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can recall a few weeks ago, Pastor Mark mentioned in his sermon that he attended a meeting at one of our local elementary schools. Uh, the meeting covered a few topics ranging from school lunches, after school programs, the lack of a music department, uh, because of funding and volunteers. And what always impresses me about Pastor Mark's messages is whenever he witnesses a need in our community, he somehow incorporates that need into the message and then encourages us to get involved. That always impresses me. But the part that really touched my heart, that really touched my heart, was the part where he mentioned that after school programs and the need for volunteers at recess and the lack of funding for a music and art department, it really touched my heart. And I'm sure the topic can come up in our conversation as believers, right? The topic can come up in some of our discussions as believers and we'll ask, why does it seem like they're taking God out of our schools? Why does it appear that they are taking God out of our schools? Well, I believe, and I presume Pastor Mark would agree, that this is the perfect opportunity for a believer to infiltrate and bring a little bit of God back into our schools. Perfect opportunity. Perfect opportunity. Now, I'm not saying that you should go to, if you felt led, to go to the school and walk in there and preach a Sunday sermon. I'm not saying that at all, and I don't think that's the point Pastor Mark was trying to make either. But if you think about the impact, if you can think about the impact a child, that you can have on a child's life by simply introducing the living God that lives inside of you to a child. You don't need to write a sermon to bring light to anyone's life or do any of the following. No one needs to write a sermon to do any of the following. To love like Christ. Demonstrate patience, offer kindness, express gratitude, operate in the Holy Spirit, explain forgiveness, express perseverance, show immeasurable faith, provide reassurance, offer encouragement, pray for those around you, and allow God to work through you and with you to impact others. You don't need to write a sermon to do any of that stuff. Some of the most powerful sermons anyone can write are the ones written by how someone lives, not what you scribble down on a piece of paper or type on a keyboard. So think about the opportunity for those who feel led and could qualify. They have a chance to impact a child's future for the kingdom of heaven. I know what some of you are thinking. In what way could I possibly impact a child's life? In what way could I possibly do that? My answer is simple. The same way your heart was influenced towards Christ. The same exact way. And chances are someone played that important role for you and influenced you to bring you to the cross of Calvary. And you have the same opportunity to do the same thing. The same thing. Now when it comes to children, I'm sure we would all agree that they're very easily influenced, right? Children are so easily influenced until they're about 13 years old and this phenomenon happens, right? They suddenly know everything. The night before they're 12 years old, they turn 13, bam, poof, they know it all. My daughter just turned 10 last month in April, and she's what, we would call a, she's what we would call a prodigy, because even before she turned 10, she knew everything. She knew everything. But this is very important, but studies show that children between the ages of 6 and 14 are at the perfect age to be influenced to do right or to do wrong. Those who conduct these studies say that a child's mind learns, hear me now, those who conduct these studies say that a child's mind learns, develops, and operates all on its own. But it's through the influence of the adult in their life that will dictate or impact how that child's life will go. How that child's life will go. And here, get this. This takes place whether you're godly or not. Your influence, whether you're godly or not, will directly impact how that child will develop and grow. Other studies stretch this gap even further to, say, even 16 years of age. And it's during these years that children will develop behaviors that they are likely to carry with them into their adult years. Therefore, 
The way we fail to lead or the way we lead is precisely how your children will lead their children in the days to come. I promise I'm building to a point, so stick with me. In the year 1933, there was a man by the name of... I never thought in a million years I'd use this guy as an example. In 1933, there was a man by the name of Adolf Hitler who understood how critical this period was in a child's life when he developed the Hitler Youth Program and literally indoctrinated millions of children who later became adults and served in his military conquest and carried out his atrocities across Europe. To give you the, an idea of the power of influence this man had, in March 1933, there was only 50,000 children members in his program. 50,000. Ten months later, there were two million. Ten months later, by the start of 1934, there were two million children active members in his Hitler Youth program. It happened that quick. History tells us it happened that quick. And millions were lost. Millions. And unfortunately, some of those evils are still taught today and carried out today. Take a guess what the target age of recruitment was between the ages of 6 and 14. This, if this is the kind of impact, if this is the kind of in, impact that one man can make with the agenda to spread hate and evil, think about, think about for a second the impact a believer can make with the agenda of unconditional love, unconditional surrender, and the power of Jesus Christ can make. If we look at verse 42 throughout, from our passage this morning, it's almost as if the Savior knew how important this period in a child's life was. It's almost as if Jesus knew how critical and how, influence, how easily influenced children can be when he said in Mark chapter 9, verse 42, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. The first application we could take from this verse is simple. Jesus has a very special place in his heart for children. The second is Jesus leaves it up to us, parents, to influence our children towards Christ. The Bible teaches in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 6, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he gets old, he will not depart from it. Here's one. When God delivered the commandments to the nation of Israel, God instructed them in this manner. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19, Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you wake up. This is the call for parents to interact with their children. And the interaction that should take place, at least in some of your discussions, at least in part of your discussions, at least a little bit in some of your discussions, is the topic of salvation. God. Jesus Christ. To teach them. To teach them. The, the interesting thing, man, the interesting thing about this is, is, is how will a child ever know or learn or develop a relationship with Christ if they don't understand the things that we've learned and developed? We understand the law, right? We understand the consequences of law. We understand the consequences of sin. We understand that. And because we understand that, right, we better understand the, the forgiveness of the cross, how do we ever expect our children to ever develop that same understanding if we don't take the time to share it with them? From Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, Only take heed to yourself and be diligently keeping yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest you depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. In other words, parents, we are to remember the things God, God has done for us in the moments of our lives when we felt completely lost. We are to remember those moments. We're to remember those moments when we felt discouraged and we felt like giving up. We're to remember those moments. We're to embrace those moments. Why? Why should we embrace those moments? Because God got us through. God got us through. We need to remember the moments our eyes were opened up for the first time and experienced the provision of forgiveness and the intimate moment that we shared with our Lord and Savior and share that moment intimately with our children so they can understand the importance of passing that information on as they grow 
and as they have children someday. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the church of Philippi, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this, that he who begun a good work in you will carry it out until the completion of Christ. Parents, we are blessed with the opportunity. Parents, we are blessed with the privilege to begin the work of God in our child's life. Absolutely, God wills it. But the beautiful part about what that little, that little verse just said is the results are up to God. We have the opportunity and the privilege to begin it, and God will see it that it's completed. How does this happen? How does this work? We begin by first being examples of his teachings found in his word by starting to dig, figuring it out. Through trusting, loving, praying audibly for your children. I said audibly, out loud so they can hear you. In other words, don't be a charlatan. Practice what you preach. Demonstrate sincere faith to the audience of little people in your house. But it doesn't end there. Jesus opens the door to everyone when he says this word, whoever. This opens the door to people who don't have children. To people who don't have any direct contact with children. This could even indicate children influencing other children. There's so many avenues one can decide from simply because Jesus said, whoever. Which is all the more of a reason, parents and grandparents, that we need to influence the future of our church, of our community, of this country. We need to influence the future. I've yet to hear a parent ever tell me in any of my conversations with any of them that I interact with that they say, you know what, Jesse? Parent, being a parent comes with an expiration date. Uh, I don't think so. And if there was such a thing as an expiration date, I guess we would call it a transition. I would much rather call it a transition. There's a really good opportunity that if you're a parent, you will someday transition into a grandparent. So therefore, being a parent means you're a parent forever. And whatever we as parents bring to our children or other believers bring to our children in our community, you can be rest assured our children will bring that same influence to their friendships, to their relationships, to their classrooms, and their fast-growing sphere of influence. You can be rest assured they will bring it. Whatever you as grandparents that you've learned over a lifetime, over a lifetime, if you pass some of that information on to your grandchildren, you can be rest assured that experience they will pass along to their fast-growing sphere of influence. It will make an impact. Whatever we bring in the name of Jesus Christ, it will make an impact. It will. We might not ever get to see the results, but we can be less rest assured that it will leave a lasting impression. But I can hear some of you now thinking, I don't have any children. I don't interact with children on a regular basis. How does this apply to me? My children have grown up and have families of their own and moved far away, and I seldom get to see them. How, how could this possibly apply to me? Well, would it surprise you that this phrase, little ones, has two different meanings or maybe two different possibilities to choose from? This Greek word spelt M-I-K-R-O-S, pronounced mirkras, carries with it this meaning. Small or little, of size, stature, or length, of age lesser by birth or younger. I have to be completely honest with you. I generally lean towards that Jesus is indeed talking about children. But, but some Bible commentators and scholars seem to think that this phrase, little ones, is a reference to young disciples in Christ. Young disciples of Christ. Think about that for just a moment. A new convert or believer in Christ can be described as little of size or stature or length based on the fact that they are a new follower in Christ. Someone who has recently given their life to Christ and just exited the waters of baptism should and could be considered a newborn in Christ. Therefore, they could be described as a little one by age or lesser of birth. For those of you who may be thinking I'm slicing this awfully thin, I encourage you to hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he said to Nicodemus, a man who was much older than him, when he said, John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
Therefore, once you are a new believer, and by the confession of faith, and you've exited the waters of baptism, technically, by definition, you have become a little one in the household of faith. Then the responsibility for the upbringing of that little one or that new follower of Christ, guess what? Falls equally upon everybody. Everybody. And if this line of thought seems to be falling on sound ears and humble thoughts, wait, there's more. If we fail to take this responsibility seriously, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the depths of the sea. If a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the depths of the sea. The very vital part of this message is what we teach. What we teach. If we teach them to stumble, it would be better for a stone, a millstone, to be hung around our neck and we were thrown into the sea. And if we're in the mood for honesty this morning, then here's your morning dose. If we fail in this area by simply not teaching at all, it would be better if a millstone were hung around our neck and we were thrown into the depths of the sea. We can fail in this area by turning a blind eye to the need to teach our children and young believers to follow Christ. And it would be better if a millstone were hung around our neck and we were thrown into the depths of the sea. We can fail in this area. We can fail in this area, those of us who claim to be mature believers, by not taking action and using the God-given privilege and responsibility to disciple believers. Now that I believe I've made my point, the question is, is how? How? How are we as parents, how are we who claim to be mature believers supposed to teach the little ones who dwell in our house or the little ones in the household of faith? Well, the beginning of that answer is simple, by our example. The very beginning of that answer, the answer to that question is by our example. No one ever likes hearing someone offering advice about life or anything to do with the teachings of Christ if they are at least not first attempting to live by what they're preaching. So the beginning of that is to practice what you preach. Be a follower. Lead by example. How do we ever expect anyone to take us Christians seriously if we are not first following and applying the Word of God to our lives? We're all acquainted with this adage, practice what you preach, but what does it look like? Well, wouldn't you know, it's almost as if Jesus knew that we were going to cover this this morning. As we read the next verses, verse 43 through 48. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It would be better for you to enter life maim rather than having two hands to go to hell and to fire that, is ne- that shall never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell and to fire that shall never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. This is the foundation of every young believer and every mature believer when it comes to the topic of sin. We are to cut it off. This is the attitude that should begin to develop in young believers to cut off sin. To cut off sin. This is the attitude that will eventually... Fasten your seatbelts for this one. This is the attitude that will eventually separate those who are serious about their faith and to those who aren't so serious about their faith based on whether the fact that, based on whether or not they wish to choose to cut some of those things off in their life. The separation is determined by those who continue to practice and apply this pattern to their life. If your eye, ca- if your, eye your foot, your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. I don't mean this in a literal point, and I don't think Jesus is meaning this literally either, or we'd have a whole bunch of armless people and legless people and a few blind people as well. But I think the principle there is found in the fact that we are to recognize it and be brave enough to do something about it and through the power of Jesus, cut it off. Through the love of Jesus Christ, cut it off. This can indicate this this could possibly indicate if it's what we are seeing that's causing us to sin. This can indicate some of the programs we watch on television, on, on our computer screens, or even what we possibly watch on our phones. This could mean what we see in public, what we see in a restaurant, or what we see in our homes. 
If what we see in our line of sight has the possibility to plant the seed of sin, we need to recognize it and remove it. Jesus is telling us here to remove it and be done with it. This, same, this is, has the same application to what we touch and also with where our feet may take us. If indeed what we touch, what we feel, where we go, what we do in our spare time has the opportunity to plant the seed of sin, Jesus is telling us to recognize it, remove it, and be brave enough to be done with it. And be done with it. And in a world where it seems like everyone is heading one direction, everyone is heading one direction, and when we as believers make the decision to change direction from the direction the world is going, and we swim against the current, don't think for one second that you will not go unnoticed. We will. It will be seen. If everyone's heading in one direction and we suddenly change direction, it will not go unnoticed. The people around us will notice the change in disposition. Our children will not, it will not go unnoticed by our children when our character begins to change, when we begin to develop a new attitude. Newly found converts will acknowledge this example and begin to what? Follow it follow it. This is the power that we take on when we remove the things that cause us to stumble. We become influential. And by our influence, we can influence the little ones who are constantly watching us. That means, uh, if you're a Christian, I'm sure you've heard of it, your life is now under a microscope. You're welcome. That means the little ones in the household of faith who have just given their life to Christ, whether you care to acknowledge it or not, are watching you are watching you. Same thing with the little children that might enter your household. They are constantly watching you, constantly learning from you. And whether you know it or not, based upon your influence, they are already making a decision on how they are going to carry out their life or their Christian life. But what is it about this that makes this such a difficult task or a challenging task for some of us? Okay, I'll change that question. What makes this such a difficult task for me? If we're completely honest, here's another dose of honesty. For the most part, it's out of habit. It's out of habit. There was a Christian woman who was in a terrible car accident as a teenager. Not long after the accident, she met a man at a hospital who had a severe limp. And they developed a friendship as they would hobble down the hallway and with the aid of his, with his, with the aid of his walker and she would follow behind him in her, in her wheelchair he looked forward to the day when the radical surgery would correct his ailment and he would be able to walk freely again. The surgery happened and sometime after, the Christian woman visited the hospital and she saw him and saw the man with the cane still limping down the hallway. And she commented to one of the doctors, it's unfortunate that that surgery didn't work for that man, huh? The doctor replied, uh, the surgery was a complete success. The fact that he still walks with a limp is out of habit is out of habit. And there's so many people in this world who are Christians but still practice the same things they practice out of habit. Simply out of habit. There has to come a point in our time, in our life, in our relationship with Christ where we begin to develop new habits, where we develop new friendships, where we develop a new life that can be carried on, that can be carried on to impact others. Okay, the second dose of honesty, and if we're completely honest, or the third, fourth, I lost count. The fourth dose of honesty, if we're, truly, if we're truly being honest this morning, if we're not developing things out of habit, or there's a habit hang up, the other chance is we don't feel like we're worth it. We don't feel like we're worth it. I have, I have a $100 bill in my pocket. Who would like to have it? I, w I, w I was told when you ask for volunteers, you bring out the money first and then ask for volunteers because if you do it the other way, no one's going to want to volunteer. Okay, I have $100 right here. This $100 is worth $100. You can spend $100 on groceries. You can spend, uh, you can take someone out after church to eat lunch with it. You can pay a bill with it. It is worth $100. So my question is, what happens if I fold it in half? It's still $100, right? 
What if I fold it again? It's still $100, right? Okay, 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 wait, wait. Here's a trick question. Get ready. What if I crumble it up? Still $100, right? What if I throw it on the ground and kick it? What if I step on it? What if I turn my back on it and walk away from it? Ah, <laughs> that's good. That was good. I wasn't expecting that one. That was good. So you mean to tell me that no matter what I do with this $100 bill, I flick it, I kick it, I crumble it up, I put it in my pocket, I turn my back on it, I spit on it, it's still worth $100, right? Still worth $100. Well, what, what makes it worth $100? Keep in mind that after 1972, money was no longer backed by gold or silver. 72, I think. No longer backed by gold and silver. So what makes this $100 bill worth $100? The trick question, face value, that's a, good, that's a good way of taking it. The fact that this $100 bill is worth $100 is because we believe it's worth $100. We believe it's worth $100. So what makes us as people any different? If we can crumble this up and it doesn't lose its value, if I can shove it in my pocket, step on it, the things that has happened to it doesn't change its value. Why do we think as a people the things that happen to us changes our value? Why is that? Maybe, just maybe, like Jerry just said, maybe we should learn to have faith in something greater than us and figure out what our value is. Because we owe it to ourselves to remove those things from our lives. To remove sin from our lives, we owe it to ourselves, right? We owe it to God to remove those things that are holding us back from being examples of his greatness. No matter what happened to that dollar bill, it didn't change its value. No matter what happens to you, it doesn't change your value. God believes in you. Therefore, you are worth more than this simple old $100. You are worth so much more to that. God said when he, when he died on the cross, he said you are bought with a price. You are bought with a price. When he stamped you, with the seal of the Holy Spirit, he said, you are worth all of this and more. All of this and more. We owe it to ourselves to develop the Christian characters, characteristics. We owe it to ourselves to develop the Christian attitude and begin the life God has promised us. No longer walking with the limp. No longer walking out of habit. But walking, what does it say? Newness of life. Newness of life. As I close out, I just want to say if there's anyone here who needs any prayer for anything, anything, come see me afterwards. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to intercede with for you. I'd love to go to war for you. I'd love to pray with you. If there's someone here today who heard something that touched their heart and they want to and, and, they, and they recognize that, man, you know, I, I give in my life to the Lord at one point in time, but I, I, I've, I've, I've developed this habit. I've de developed this, this habit where, where, oh, wait, 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 I never really developed the habit. I, I continued in the same old habit, and, and I want to rededicate my life to the Lord and begin to develop something else. Come see me afterwards, man. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to just talk with you. We can go out and get coffee. We can hang out. We can do whatever but I would love to show you what it means, what it means to develop a new life with Christ. And if there's anyone here who wants to just uh, give their life to the Lord, they heard something today, man, and they just, man, I want to give my life to the Lord. I'd love the opportunity to pray with you. I'd love the opportunity. I would consider it an honor and a privilege to lead you to Christ. But as we close out, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for your message. We thank you, God, that you are with us. You guide us and you direct us, God. We thank you, God, so much. And for the hearts that you've impacted here today, God, I pray that we take this message, your message, the message of truth, and we begin to speak life through our actions to those around us, God. That we begin to develop new characteristics. That we determine our value in you and not in what this world has to offer, God. That we decided, God, long ago to give our lives to you. So therefore, we begin to decide here and now not to carry around some of those old habits and hang-ups. I pray in Jesus' name that we begin to be examples to our children and to our children's children, God, that we show them what it means to be a child of God, 
and what it means to be a follower of Christ and what you can do in a life that is willing. We thank you and we praise you, God, for all that you do and all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.